I have said again and again that I really don't like study Bibles, although recently the only physical copy of the Bible I had was a big chunky Jerusalem Bible, which no less an expert than R. Grant, R. Grant Jones said was one of his favorite study Bibles. But in a fit of generosity, I gave it away. And then, although I had, as I say, I guess 16 Kindle editions, I had no physical book open to page 132 Bible. And about that time, I got a flyer from something called Christian Books with about 40 pages of study Bibles, all of them uh, nice and Protestant and telling me what the uh, Bible really meant for me, someone who was uh, a long time Protestant at least, should be expected to to know uh, the meaning of without any uh, interpretation by mere humans. Now, I guess I should uh, exhibit full disclosure and admit that although I, I didn't didn't uh, buy any of those many study Bibles and Christian book, I did eventually uh, get another copy of the Jerusalem Bible in this nice chunky original edition because, well, it's just been an important part of my intellectual life in one way or another since, I don't know, 1967 or so. I think it was 1967 that I first discovered it. But between giving it away and buying it again, I did uh, I did order an official study Bible, the Orthodox study Bible, and I am pretty well pleased with it. Let me explain. Now, there actually are three different editions of uh, the Orthodox study Bible available at this time. And I got the Thomas Nelson edition, um, which I'll let you read about. There are two editions published by Ancient Faith, both sewn. And um, that was tempting. The, the less expensive sewn edition um, is covered in that kind of shiny shiny paper just like this dust jacket and I don't uh, I don't much like that and then for twice as much as I spent for for this edition there is a a leather soft edition also published by Ancient Faith but I I'm kind of a cheapskate I suppose gosh it's bright and sunny can you read this? I hope you can. Uh, and see if we make it focus a little better. I guess that's okay. It's just very contrasty. I uh, I like the looks of this cover. It's you know paper over cardboard, but it's an I think an attractive paper over cardboard. And again, the S R Grant Jones has this edition, and he says it is held up fine. For years. Now I remember, oh gosh, 30 years ago or more it was now when the Orthodox Study Bible New Testament and Psalms were published and when I heard it was coming I was kind of excited and then when it came I was kind of disappointed. It felt very Protestant. I mean it is a study Bible and I remember when I was a Baptist and didn't know where my first study Bible was the Schofield Reference Bible, uh, which was a theologically very fascinating kind of text, uh, but uh, how valuable it was to understand scriptures, I'm not sure. I did get extra points if I took it to Sunday school, however. Let's move this up just a bit. Um, and it was published by Oxford University Press, which I thought gave it a certain panache and authority that it really didn't have. But I think it's important to recognize that the 
the uh, Oxford Study Bible really did start as kind of a, a spin-off of um, a Protestant Christians who uh, kind of led by Jack Sparks in many ways, most of them, um, who became Orthodox. And they were used to having uh, a written tradition of Scripture in a way that many Orthodox Christians do not have. I think I mentioned, and if not, I will now, how much I dislike dislike the uh, idea of pew Bibles, where we read along rather than listening to the Word of God. And of course, in the Orthodox liturgies, um, the Bible is read, and no one has expected to read along was it supposed to listen to the Word of God. So, there's an introduction to it. There are kind of, I think, four sorts of uh, notes. There's some notes from the ancient church fathers, and here's their abbreviations. There's some of the um, uh, New King James Version source notes. Uh, there are notes showing where passages are used in the liturgy, and there are some notes that are just written by the by the editors. And it is very much a, a very traditional understanding of Scripture. It's not, you know, the newest, this 15 minutes. <laughs> it's um, what the Church has come to understand through living the Scripture, and that's kind of where it ends, by the way, this book, uh, rather than than trying to uh, explain it away. And it is very much the Bible in the context of the church. So it starts, uh, well, it doesn't start, it starts by introducing this edition of the Bible, but then this Bible is in the context of the Orthodox Church. I remember seeing not long ago a, a video where this Protestant was saying, the Orthodox don't want you to read the Bible. <sighs> well, the Orthodox certainly want you to hear the Bible, and if you go, to, you know, faithfully to the liturgy, and especially the Matins as well as, as the, the Eucharistic liturgy, you will hear vast amounts of the Bible again and again. Um, but it's very clear that here is the Church which produced the scriptures. By the way, it's not that the Orthodox Church doesn't want you to read the Bible. It wants you to read it within the context of the the uh, company of all the saints, not just yourself and maybe one one guy who thought he figured it out, like Mr. Schofield. And so there is a a kind of a introduction to the history of the Orthodox Church, and it's fairly brief, and I'm sure. Some historians would quibble, and some would wish it would say more, but I haven't found anything objectionable. But one of the things I find fascinating is it's talking about how recently orthodoxy has had a big growth spurt, particularly in the United States, and, well, in England as well. And so, uh, for people who, you know, may have heard about the Orthodox Church, something that is tangible that they can have in their hands even if they can't go to the church easily down at the corner like they can the Baptist is not a, a bad thing. And there are chapter introductions, theme introductions uh, to sometimes to each book, sometimes to each section. One of the criticisms that uh, has been made is that although this says it's the text of the New King James Version corrected to match the um, the Septuagint the Septuagint says that Cain said let us go out into the field and this uh, translation says Cain talked with Abel and I suspect there's some other little places in there that it might vary from the Septuagint, but for the most part, it's uh, pretty faithful. Now, I uh, particularly like, for instance, that the approach to the Psalms is that they are Christological. And so we start with, Blessed 
is the man, not not blessed is the woman, but it has to do with that uh, scandal of particularity and that the Christ, the second person of the Trinity, comes as a man. It does follow the Septuagint when a body you have prepared for me rather than ears you have dug for me, that sort of thing. Let's look at some particular notes, shall we? I um, was reading Ezekiel, but as I am changing over from the Western lectionary to the Eastern lectionary, I finished Ezekiel and I'm starting with, with Hebrews. Editor Dale here. Uh, I have seen some reviews of the, uh, of the Orthodox Study Bible that complain because the notes don't reflect all the different variations that all the different sects of particularly Protestant Christianity have had about the text over the last 15 minutes. Well, duh. The purpose of this Bible is not to give us a history of recent Western intellectualism. It is to help us find the scriptures, to use the scriptures, to be used by the scriptures, to be incorporated more and more fully into the body of Christ. And right off the bat, the book of Hebrews catches the notes anyway, catches that because I sort of thought that the book of Hebrews might have been written by Apollos, but it explains how uh, I would be alone in that interpretation pretty much. I mean, there are there are a lot of scholars who, who kind of wonder, well, was this written by Paul? And because the book of Hebrews is such an important turning point in the understanding of the church from the uh, the revelation of the Old Testament and its fulfillment in the New Testament, there are a lot of notes. And um, this is probably one of the, this is certainly the most densely annotated chapter, uh, book rather, that I have read. And I have, uh, have as often as not, more often than not, found the notes helpful as I mentioned, I have a, uh, a Kindle edition, and if you like Kindles, the Kindle edition is really very good. The, the, you know, you tap on a point in the text, it takes you to the note, you read the note, you tap on it, and it goes back much easier than in some Kindles. Um, and of course, there is this little, little explanation, because... You know, this is not an easy book to understand. Uh, and one needs help. And it's nice to find help from people who have been been living with the church, as the church, within the church, for a good long while. So, you know, if you're going to have notes, I think these are the sort to have. And it doesn't hurt to have, you know, the textual variations and the like. But then after the, the text itself, oh, I should go back and show, show um, one other thing. Uh, it has icons, and I am not entirely sure whether I like these icons or not. <laughs> they are kind of... Well, I have two problems with the one. I'm not sure if an icon is exactly the sort of thing that should be a book illustration. And then just the style of them is, is very modern. But I suppose that's not a bad thing in a book, which is a sort of a modern a modern concession of the church. Um, it's kind of a new new apologetics in many ways. And you know, there's one of the one of the essays about about the uh, nature of the body of Christ that there are four orders in church government, and then there is this nice little section, which is uh, interesting in a number of ways. The Bible. I, I wouldn't mind if the paper were a little thicker. I don't think if if the babe, if anyone knows whether the paper is thicker in the um, in the uh, ancient faith edition, let me know because that might be worth the extra money. The Bible, God's revelation to man. 
the idea that yes indeed this is God showing God's self as we say these days revealing himself to us not just the uh, record of our family ways of understanding God so that it's not that somehow this revelation is inferior to this later revelation it's just that this later revelation is fuller than the earlier revelation um, and it also makes the point that we need this revelation you know it's interesting we spend billions and billions of dollars on telescopes to explore outer space and I'm not sure if that uh, if that improves our life in any significant way do I really need to know what's going on in some nebula that some telescope says is some distance away but you know I do find that I need salvation not salvation in the sense of oh take it out of hell salvation in making my daily life my uh, part of a journey that leads to the heavenly throne uh, uh, salvation that cures the ills the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune um, you know this kind of salvation that is ultimately theosis and then there is a uh, essay by Callisto Laura of recent memory a lot of memory and it's quite good I think one read the Bible with obedience by obedience he means not just do what it says but really listen to what it's saying there is a tendency for us to want to reduce scripture to a list of do this don't do this and it's uh, it's no it's more nuanced than that I mean if God wrote the Bible, I suspect he's at least as good a writer as uh, Tolstoy or Dostoevsky. And I don't think we would think we understood crime and punishment if we just read selected verses. We need to listen to the story that is being told. And it is a story that includes us, but doesn't begin with us so we understand the bible through the experience of the church for the last oh, two thousand years and well i guess it was two thousand less six or so and at the heart of the bible is christ this of course is i mean i say it again and again but i uh, i growing up in in mid nowhere the word of god was a book and if you just came to understand that book everything was well <sighs> no Christ is the Word of God the heart of the of the the Bible which is itself an icon of God in fact you know in in most Orthodox temples there is the Gospels on a, on a stand that one can venerate as one does other icons and at the heart of this icon is Christ himself okay you know Bible only your fans <laughs> here's the lectionary beginning with Pascha and going through through the um, through the Bible not reading interestingly enough um, Revelation the Apocalypse the Apocalypse is a special book in the Orthodox Church and it isn't read in the liturgy it is I would suggest and I may try to make a video about this although I'm kind of not adequate to such a task the liturgy is <laughs> is the acting out of the of the apocalypse the, the New Jerusalem and um, um, anyway Although, you know, I think it's in the Coptic Church that they read the Apocalypse every every Pascha. It's a convenient glossary because there are some of the words that might be a little bit fuddling. I, I, I confess I actually haven't ever looked up any of the words in here. But that's... Ah, I was wondering where that was. 
Um, and then there is morning and evening prayer. And I don't usually use it myself, but, and that's how come I, I lost this list of people who'd asked me to pray for them. Um, because I had used it, I used it once upon a time. But it's not, uh, you know, it wouldn't hive if I used this. I mean, if one were going to be like John Wesley, a man of one book, this might be the one to have. And this is something that the Oxford, I mean, the, <laughs> the uh, Orthodox Study Bible shares with the Jerusalem Bible. It has an index to the annotations so that if one is interested in any particular topic, oh, uh, say, let me put on my glasses. Far, oops, I'm far off discernment. Here are the places that the notes say the scripture is talking about discernment. Uh, well, and then the 70, the, you know, these are the, do you remember Jesus sent out not just 12, but also the 70, and here they are. And then they're the usual, I think these are just the, the maps that are in every Thomas Nelson uh, edition of the Bible, and you know, they always seem not very detailed, but uh, it um, probably helps to have them to strengthen the book, but you might want to want to use them to see where where folks wandered around. And if you get the fancier edition from um, Ancient Faith Press, the extra prayers, the prayers for an absolute communion, are in this same paper stock at the front, and that might be a reason to get the the better edition, or more expensive edition. Well, there you have it, boys and girls. My um, <laughs> my apology for breaking down and buying a genuine study Bible. I haven't had it long enough to to really understand all of its uh, uses and details. And I I, I said I was kind of disappointed in the. Uh, New Testament Psalms, I thought was kind of tacky. I think the typography is is still, uh, I don't know, do we really need all this half tones? Um, and I've never been a great fan of this Sansa Reef font that looks like something you see in a subway. But I think it's a much nicer looking book in many ways than the the first edition. And uh, for what you get, I think it's a, a very good price. I think this is about $30. So if you were looking for a study Bible, I would recommend, I would recommend this one. It has, of course, all the, all the books of the Orthodox canon, and it has a little chart in the front that explains how those differ from, um, the use of the Roman Church, or the use of the Anglican Church, or the use of the Hebrews, and uh, all in all, I think it's a pretty neat little book. Well, thanks for watching.